Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. All right, good morning. Good morning. Other than Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul, Peter is probably one of the most well-known characters that we read of in the New Testament. And one of the, I guess, negatives of that for Peter is that we, thousands of years later, still talk about him and talk about the mistakes that he made and the blunders that he made and when, when all of us make mistakes and blunders. But certainly one of the greatest mistakes that Peter made throughout his discipleship with Jesus was the time that he denied Jesus when Jesus was on trial. And we know, of course, that he deeply regretted that when he realized what he had done. And we know as well that he repented and that he dedicated his life from that point on to teaching and preaching about Christ. And we have in Acts chapter 2, I think, um, a wonderful example of Peter, in my mind, trying to make up, if you will, for the mistake that he had made when he denied Christ. In Acts chapter 2, we have an account of the day of Pentecost, and Peter preaches a sermon about Christ to a crowd of Jews that had assembled there in Jerusalem from all over the world. And during this sermon, his number one goal, his number one aim is to convince those Jewish people who were listening to his words that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And he goes about doing that by making three main points. First of all, he points out that Jesus' deity was, number one, confirmed by the Father. Second of all, he points out that Jesus' death was not an accident, but rather was part of God's plan all along. And then number three, he reminds the people that Jesus is, was no longer in his tomb. And so we're going to look at each of those points uh, this morning, and then we're going to ask the question, how should that affect you and I? How should we respond to Peter's sermon, which he preached 2,000 years ago? First of all, notice that in verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, notice, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So Peter here makes the statement that God himself had attested to Jesus being his son. You might remember that Jesus did very plainly make the claim during his public ministry that he was a son of God. In John chapter 9, Jesus had given a, a blind man back his sight. And without going into all the detail of what takes place, we know that this, this blind man was uh, eventually cast out of the synagogue because of what Jesus had done for him. And we read in, in John 9, verses 35 through 38, When Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. So here we have a very plain account. Jesus did not, uh, was not uh, deceitful. He did not beat around the bush. He very plainly here proclaimed in a public way that he was the Son of God. Now to the Jews, by doing that, Jesus was proclaiming himself to be equal to God. We, you know, we tend to look at a father-son relationship as... 
the father is superior and the son is, you know, a smaller version, you know, um, uh, somehow inferior. But no, the Jews viewed that as Jesus saying that he was equal to God. In John 5 and verse 18, at another point when Jesus had made the claim to be the son of God, it says the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, which he didn't really do, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So there is no middle ground here. Either Jesus is who he claimed to be, either he's telling the truth, and therefore we need to devote ourselves and give him our service and our devotion, or he was either a liar or he was a crazy man, and therefore he's not worthy of our service and devotion. Well, Peter says that one of the proofs that Jesus was indeed the Son of God is that God the Father had attested to his claims. Now, in our verse, in verse 22 of Acts chapter 2, he, one of the ways that the Father did that was by the miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through Jesus. And so the miracles that Jesus performed were an attestation to his deity. The word attest, it means to approve or to set forth or to show. And God did that through the miracles that Jesus did. But also, well, look also in John 5 and verse 36 where Jesus points out, I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me. That the Father has sent me. So again, Jesus in John chapter 5 was setting forth numerous witnesses to his deity. And he had mentioned John the Baptist as one of those witnesses. But he says, I have a greater witness than John. My Father has attested to my deity by the works that I am doing. We know also, though, that not only through Jesus' miracles did God put his stamp of approval on Jesus, but he did it in a very direct way at his baptism. In Matthew 3 and verse 17, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, we have the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, how could anyone then have any doubt if a voice from heaven speaks and says, That's my Son, and I am well pleased. In my son, and not only at his baptism, but you might remember also when he was on the Mount of, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, where Jesus took Peter, James and John up on the mountain with him and Elijah and Moses appeared there with Jesus and he was talking with them. And uh, Peter says, you know, Lord, let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then we have God saying, in Matthew 17, 5, while he was still speaking, while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Peter, again, had made a blunder there, and he didn't even realize it. In that, he was putting Elijah and Moses on, an, on a level plane, if you will, with Jesus and saying, let's build a tabernacle for all three of you. And Jesus wanted Peter and us to understand that while Elijah and Moses, yes, they were great men and faithful servants of God, Jesus was his son. And Jesus was the one whom Peter was to listen to and obey. And he was the one with all authority. And he tells us as well by it being recorded for us in Scripture. So in trying to prove that Jesus was the Son of God, first of all, Peter says, we can know He was the Son of God because the Father attested to His deity by His works, the miraculous things that He did, but also directly with a voice from heaven on many occasions, he, or a few occasions at least, He proclaimed that Jesus was His Son. Now, Peter also made it a point to emphasize that the death of Jesus was according to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. In verse 23 of Acts 2, 
Peter says, him, Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Many would have seen the death of Jesus as proof that he was not who he claimed to be. You understand that even today, people's idea of a God is one who is all-powerful and who will not... Uh, take any foolishness from his servants. And so the idea of a God who would lay down his life and allow his creation to treat him in the manner that Jesus did, to many would seem foolish. You might remember in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul said that to the Greeks, the preaching of the cross was foolishness. Well, why is that? Well, all their gods... They wouldn't put up with something like that. They wouldn't allow man to treat them in that way. And so it was foolishness to them. And we even know that uh, as he was on the cross, there were some who snickered and sneered. In uh, Luke 23, 35, it says, they said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. In other words, the idea being, well, if he was really who he claimed to be, he wouldn't be up there on that cross. If he was really who he claimed to be, he'd come down and boy, then we would believe. And so this idea that he died, especially before his resurrection, many would have looked at that as a failure on the part of Jesus. That he hadn't completed his work, he hadn't done what he had come to do, and that man had somehow defeated his purpose. So Peter wanted them to understand that the sacrificial death of Jesus was God's intention all along. Christ was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. In Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul, writing about this, says, "...to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose..." which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice Paul mentions an eternal purpose that was accomplished in Christ Jesus. Certainly his going to the cross was not something that took, him, took God or Jesus himself by surprise. It was something that God had intended all along. We could read the Messianic prophecies from the Old Testament, passages like Isaiah 53, the 22nd Psalm. Um, These passages and many others talk about the sacrificial death of Jesus. And Jesus alludes to that when he's talking to his disciples after he had been resurrected in Luke 24 and verse 46, where he says, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Thus it was written, he's looking back to those Old Testament prophecies, and he's again reminding them, I I don't want you all to think that I failed, or that somehow uh, the people have defeated God's plans. This was all part of the plan all along. Peter wanted the people to understand that, and we need to understand it as well. It's still important for us to grasp this. Because there are some who believe that um, believe the opposite, that Jesus did not really come to die on the cross. There are those in the world today who believe that the intention of God, the intention of Jesus, his son, uh, was to set up an earthly kingdom. But since he was rejected by the Jews, he sort of he went to plan B. And instead of setting up his kingdom, they say he, the plan B was the church. Well, there's, there's a problem with that. If we think about that idea logically, <clears throat> number one, if Jesus had wanted to be an earthly king, can you think of anything that could have stopped him? He's the son of God. He can walk on water. He can calm a storm with a word. He can bring people back from the dead. I think that would imply he could take life if he wanted it very easily. And there's nobody that could have stopped him if he wanted to be an earthly king. There was even a time in his ministry when the people wanted to do that very thing. Do you remember? It's in, it was after he uh, fed all of those people in John chapter 6 and verse 15. 
They were going to make him king. And it says, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed again into the mountain by himself alone. He, that wasn't his goal. That wasn't his purpose. He never intended to be an earthly king. Another logical problem with the belief that he didn't really come to die is that if the plans of Jesus were foiled by those stubborn Jews, then who is to say that his plans could not be foiled when he comes back again by everyone else? You see, it it implies that God is not really all-powerful. That God is not really all-knowing that he was caught off guard by the rejection of the Jews. And so it, it, it reflects upon the power and omniscience of God. The truth is that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It was never intended to be of this world. And it took his death to purchase that kingdom and to bring it into existence. And we know when he was talking with Pilate in John 18 and verse 36... He made that very statement, my kingdom is not of this world. There was a discussion there about him being a king. And he says, yes, I'm a king, but understand my kingdom is not of this world. And he says, if it was, my my disciples would fight for me and deliver me from the Jews. But he says, my kingdom is not from here. And so he made it very clear. And then the other problem with this idea that, you know, maybe Jesus didn't really come to die is... If he didn't come here to die, then logic can only lead to one conclusion, and that is that he wasn't the Son of God. Because, again, the Son of God, he wouldn't be caught off guard. He wouldn't be defeated by man, his creation. And so the only conclusion can be, really, that he wasn't the Son of God. And this next point isn't in your outline that I'm about to mention, but... Also think about this. If Jesus did not come to die, what in the world was God going to do about our sin problem? His death on the cross was God's solution to the problem of sin in the world. We can't pay for that sin. We're sinful ourselves. He needed a sinless sacrifice. And so if he didn't come to die on the cross, what was God going to do? That was his only solution to the problem of our sin and how he could uh, at one time be both just and merciful. Well, it was by sending Jesus to die and pay the price for our sins. So um, that's another uh, argument that you can't get around. No, Jesus was, his death was the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So number one, Peter says, God attested him to you by his miracles and works and wonders that he did in your midst. Number two, he says, understand that uh, his death was planned all along. That was part of God's plan for the redemption of mankind. And then the third point that Peter makes is that uh, God raised him up. Acts 2 and verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed from the, loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Really, this was another way that God had attested to Jesus to show that he was who he claimed to be the Son of God. In Romans 1 and verse 4, Paul makes that clear, that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So that was another way that God attested and said, you know what, that's my Son. You need to hear Him, you need to obey His will. In his sermon here in Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes from the 16th Psalm, uh, verses 8 through 11, he quotes. And and this is a a psalm of David that he's quoting. And in this psalm, David predicts that his soul would not be left in Hades. But the question has to come, well, whose soul was David referring to? He wasn't referring to his own. Peter points that out in verse 29 of Acts chapter 2 because he says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. So in other words, David's soul was still at that very time and still is today uh, in Hades. Therefore, David wasn't talking about himself when he wrote that prophecy, but rather verses 30 to 32, Peter sums it up and says, Therefore, 
being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And so again, he is emphasizing the resurrection of Jesus and he's pointing out that even David, whom these Jews believed in and whom they held in high esteem, David had foreseen that Jesus was going to be resurrected. As a result of the resurrection of Jesus, and this really is, verse 36 is the conclusion of Peter's sermon. Here's the point he's trying to make and he makes it in Acts 2 and verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, there's no need to doubt, know this assuredly, that God has made this Jesus, and then he says, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the whole point of his lesson, the whole point of his sermon. He wanted them to understand that they had crucified Put to death in a horrible manner, the Son of God. Well, how were they to respond to that information? We're told that many of those who heard Peter's sermon were cut to the heart. The very next verse, Acts 2 and verse 37, we read, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? First of all, that phrase, they were cut to the heart. And that, I think, has a reference to a godly sorrow that they felt. And you remember godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, produces repentance leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so we're told that they were cut to the heart when they heard this, when they realized that they were responsible for putting debt to death, the Son of God, they were cut to the heart. And they experienced godly sorrow. How do I know it was godly sorrow? Because they asked the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow says, I'm sorry, what can I do to make it better? Worldly sorrow says, I'm sorry, but they don't say What can I do to make it better? They just go right on behaving the way that they've been behaving all along. They wanted to make it right. They asked the apostles then, okay, you've convinced us. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What do we need to do to make that right? How can we be forgiven of that? And Peter tells them in verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, these people had already come to believe in Jesus. That's what led them to ask the question. But belief wasn't enough. There was more to do. They had to repent. They had to turn to God and follow God and do His will. They had to be baptized for the remission of sins. The word baptize, as you know, means immerse. It means to be immersed, not sprinkled, not poured. It means to be immersed, to to be buried. And that's another metaphor that is used to describe baptism, a burial. And then they would receive the remission of sins. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 that there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal, the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, what is their response? They say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, you need to repent now. Now that you believe, you need to repent. You need to be baptized in order to have your sins remitted or forgiven. We know, of course, as well that Paul tells us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that a confession is, needs to be made as well. That with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The confession that we believe Jesus to be the Son of God. As you sit here this morning and listen to this account of Peter's sermon about Jesus, 
Hopefully, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why you're here this morning. If you believe that, then I ask you to respond as these people responded. And if you are not in a right relationship with God at this time, make that right. Feel sorrow for the sin that you've committed, but make it a godly sorrow and try to make it right. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do just what we've discussed. You need to repent of the sin in your life, confess your faith in Jesus, and be baptized that your sins might be washed away. Most of us have done that, but maybe there are some here this morning who, even though they obeyed the gospel at one point, have since become unfaithful. You're no longer living the way that you should, and you need to come back. If that's the case, there's no need to be baptized again. We're told that for the Christian who sins and whose heart is no longer right with God, that they are to repent and ask God's forgiveness. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer. If, uh, if you are not in a right relationship with God, we're going to sing a song. It's, I think it's, is thy heart right with God? Uh, and if your heart is not right with God, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.